What do Bach and Beethoven have in common? They both wrote sonatas. A sonata? The is sonata a is a piece for two musical instruments. Or voices representing instruments. Two voices, four movements. Fairy Lease, Country Garden, Humoresque and Danny Boy. <sighs> we sit in our huts at night and hum. We do it while we dug the graves. And when I had the strength, I'd tap out the rhythm, waving the shoehorn. We sang our sonata whenever we could, so the camp would know there was still music left. It probably sounded bloody awful, but not to us. To us, it meant that we still had harmony. People ask why I wrote the Schuhorn Sonata. In 1995, the United Nations announced that more civilians die in war than soldiers. Yet there are no days on which the deaths of these civilians are commemorated or even remembered. They're simply forgotten by history. I wanted to write a play that reminded people of this fact and that celebrated those people who were killed in war. The Shoehorn Sonata is the untold story of hundreds and thousands of women imprisoned by the Japanese in Southeast Asia. It's the story of Bridie and Sheila who have been separated for half a century and are now brought together for the filming of a television documentary. This experience forces them to relive the past, contact the present and question the future. The Schuhorn Sonata is an inspiring, warm, sometimes humorous, but always truthful story. At the fall of Singapore, I was a civilian internee and this is a story that had to be told. Internees included Australian army nurses, the forgotten war trauma victims who were just left to get on with life. The story is a human one about real people and it also shows how the spirit can shine through even in the darkest hour. Before I left Singapore, Mother said to me, you'll be living with colonials now, so set a good example. Always wear gloves, wherever you go. Don't socialise with Catholics, unless they're French or titled. And never kiss an Australian on the lips. I was on a small ship, it, it was called the Jang B. It sailed up to Singapore with 300 people on board. Well, we told we'd be back in a couple of weeks, so it was all rather fun, really. You know, like a, like a trip up river. We slept on deck, under the moon. I, I woke suddenly, it, it was about 3 a.m. There were people running everywhere, I could see them quite clearly. The deck was so bright. But this wasn't moonlight. The Japanese had found our ship and fixed a searchlight on it to pin us in position. The strong hard beams hit us square in the face, so we lay on the deck and covered our eyes, but our sailors were yelling, get up! Stand up! Show the Japanese you're just women and children! So we... We all stood up for the Japanese. Some mothers clutched their children and cried. And we stared into the light. For a while nothing happened, just the roar of the sea and us, ghostly white on the deck. And then there were flashes, like, like sparks in the distance and the sound of crackers going off. Women were screaming and running about and some lay groaning and being trod on. Then sailors were yelling, jump for it, jump for it. One of them asked if I knew how to swim. A bit, I replied, so he, he picked me up and threw me overboard. The next thing I, I found myself splashing about in the water. Then th th there was this, this deafening noise. The whole of the ship rose up out of the water and crashed on its side. It lay there like a wounded animal, spilling oil instead of blood. It took less than a minute for the Jangbi to sink. I'm, I'm not quite sure what happened. Oh, oh yes, yes, I, I grabbed some wood to buoy me up. I didn't have a life belt. I remember these, these little toys came drifting by. Tiny boats that really sailed and dolls with eyes that opened and stared. I clung to the wood and yelled for my mother. Why did she have to stay behind? Who cared if the Japs took her beastly silver? Whenever I could, I yelled for help, but 
the night was so dark and nobody came. At the Chatswood dances, I'd always been a bit of a wallflower. And now here was this Jap giving me the eye. He thrust a glass of sake at me, so I smiled and said, Thank you, sir. May you always have syphilis. He didn't understand. In fact, my resistance seemed to excite him. His cheeks were red and he was dribbling, and I kept trying to wriggle away. The others were doing pretty much the same, except for one. She was laughing and smiling and getting on really well with her Jap. I couldn't believe it. One of us giving in. But every time he'd go to kiss her, she'd giggle and flirt and then cough very slightly and he'd suddenly pull away. Well, she did this half a dozen times and then with great apology, she produced a piece of rag to use as a handkerchief and it was covered with blood. <laughs> now the Japs weren't scared of much, but they were terrified of tuberculosis and this lass knew it. She'd taken that piece of rag from the hospital hut to use as a last resort. <sighs> that bit of rag saved all our lives that day. Soon I was coughing and the others were coughing. Well, the Japs just gave up and sent us home. <laughs> That night put me off blind dates forever. <laughs> <laughs>